Lord McCull of Dulwich. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, I pay tribute to my noble friend for his continuing interest in wanting to improve services in this important area. As an ex-surgeon, he has significant expertise and insight. From 1st of April this year, NHS England Specialised Commissioning has required all limb centres delivering amputee services to complete a data reporting template which will collect the information described. The data is not expected to be published as a national statistic, but is collected to support the commissioning process. Lord, I, I thank the Minister very much indeed for her usual helpful reply. Uh, she's done so well in stimulating the Department of Health because uh, in November last year the Department told us that they didn't collect this information centrally. So I'm very glad that she's had success. May I ask, is the information going to be collated? My Lords, um, the data collection is not expected to be published routinely, but is submitted from the provider to the relevant commissioning hub as a contractual requirement under Schedule 6 of the NHS contract information reporting requirements. Um, but I hope my noble friend uh, will be pleased to hear. We will be considering uh, making a summary of this data available in due course once we have established that it is being collected and reported appropriately. Being fitted with a new knee can completely change a person's life. So I wonder if the Minister could tell the House what advice is given to clinical commissioning groups about commissioning knee replacements. Living in Cornwall, I would be treated sooner than if I lived on the Isle of Wight. Uh, when would the Minister expect the weight in the Isle of Wight to be the same as Cornwall? <laughs> Well, my Lord, I, I hope that any uh, variations in any service uh, is dealt with and reduced um, as possible. As the noble Baroness will be aware, that uh, NHS England do commission the prosthesis centrally, and they do have a service specification. Um, and the NHS England has a duty to reduce inequalities in access to health services and in the health outcomes achieved, as enshrined in the Health and Social Care Act of uh, 2012. But certainly, the principle is to reduce inequalities. My Lord, is my noble friend aware that, as uh, personally, I'm the recipient of a new knee three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what a wonderful job the National Health Service do in Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Well, I thank my noble uh, lord uh, for, for his uh, uh, support for the NHS and indeed for his new knee, and I hope it continues to work effectively and properly for a very long time. Yeah. My lord, um, uh, two questions for the noble lady. One is that um, many of the amputations that people face are as a result of diabetes. And it seems to, so I'd like to uh, hear from the noble lady what progress the National Prevention Programme is making to reduce the number of amputations. And, then, and the second question is to do with quality control. NHS England uh, organised, as, as the noble lady will know, a patient <coughs> survey last year. And they reported one of the biggest issues for people was getting a comfortable and timely socket fit, with people expressing frustration that this sometimes isn't always a get right first time situation and of course that is absolutely vital so my second question is about quality control as well as collecting data um, I thank the noble uh, Baroness just to, to let her know that NHS England invested over £9 million of transformation funding in 2017-18 to further reduce amputation rates in people with diabetes by putting in place new expanded and multidisciplinary foot care teams. Um, and just to let the House know that overall the major amputation incidence in England is now one of the lowest internationally, and it is because of this investment. Um, in terms of the review, um, as the noble lady has correctly said, a review was uh, undertaken and um, the, the clinicians will uh, look at this, uh, the outcomes from that re review, um, review and will take the appropriate action in due course to ensure that some of the complaints that have been made that have been addressed adequately. My Lord, is it proposed that amputees from the armed forces, either serving or uh, previously, are going to be included as a subgroup, bearing in mind the importance of maintaining the military covenant? 
a lot um, military uh, 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 service provide uh, an important and dedicated service and it's absolutely right and fundamental that we support them in their times of need. The Veterans Prosthetic Panel supports the Armed Forces community requiring prosthetics, ensuring that they receive the latest prosthetics, uh, including the next generation micro uh, processor needs, with over 97% of claims being approved in 2016-17 and over 1.5 million being spent on prosthetic centres. Tell us whether the statistics will include amputations as a result of sepsis, and I declare an interest as having a family member uh, who, who was affected by this, uh, um, perhaps as a, as a motivation and inspiration uh, to encourage what has been increasing awareness of sepsis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry to hear of, of the experience that the noble uh, lady um, family has faced. Sepsis is a very important issue and, it's, and we are dealing um, uh, uh, very effectively with ensuring that we can bring uh, that issue into control. Um, all uh, amputations as a result of whatever the issues uh, are for it are being taken very seriously and we are offering the same kind of service so that we do cut down the variations that are, that are in the system um, and of course the current review that I've just mentioned will take into consideration um, all issues that patients have raised. My Lord, so following on from the question that Baroness Thornton asked about the relationship of amputations and diabetes type 1, the worrying aspect is a great deal of variations in the amputation rates across England. Would the noble Baroness, the Minister, agree that the areas that have high rates of amputation should be asked to look at how they are following the guidelines issued by NICE and whether they are adhering to that to reduce the rates? I mean, I do agree with the noble lord. It's very important that we do reduce the variations, um, and, and it's very important that NICE guidelines are, are um, followed. Um, the uh, NHS England's service specifications um, has a duty to reduce inequalities and of course um, the service specification, uh, specification set a number of uh, issues uh, which, in, uh, which ensure that there is improved access including um, flexible appointments, rehabilitation and re-ablement. But of course we've got to address the variation first. The noble order is quite correct. Would the Minister agree that the way to reduce the number of ampute amputations is to reduce the cause? Mm. Uh, the obesity epidemic is one of the causes. So if uh, the waist measurement is more than half the height, it means they're eating too much of the gross national product. <laughs> My Lord, absolutely I concur with the noble lord. As someone who's had a problem with her weight all her life, I do agree, not as easy to do um, uh, as, uh, as it is to say, but obesity does play a key role in diabetes and we do need to get it into control. Noel McConnell of Dinescorridale. My Lord, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name in the order paper. My Lords, the UK Government has frequent engagement with the Scottish Government. UK and Scottish Government Ministers are due to meet on the 9th of May 2019 at the meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations. I myself am scheduled to meet the Scottish Government Ministers as part of the DEFRA Devolved Administration Interministerial Group for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs on the 20th of May 2019. The agenda for both meetings are yet to be finalised. Um, my Lords, next week sees the 20th anniversary of the first elections to the uh, devolved Scottish Parliament, uh, and I am sure the whole House would want to uh, congratulate those civil servants and legislators who created, uh, despite all the political ups and downs of the last 20 years, such a stable institution that has actually legislated and budgeted on a consistent basis since that time, despite rarely having a political majority for one party. Given uh, that the success of the scheme was based on debate and discussion in the Constitutional Convention, and very well thought through legislation. Uh, would it not be the case that in the UK at the moment, when uh, whatever happens with Brexit, there needs to be a good hard look at our constitutional uh, arrangements and our relationship with the public, uh, that a model such as a constitutional convention, looking on an all-party basis and improving the governance of the United Kingdom as a whole, might be a way forward in these times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Noble Lord is right to draw attention to the 
sterling efforts of all those civil servants who brought about a functioning and sustainable Scottish Parliament and indeed a Welsh Assembly Government as well. There has been extraordinary progress and it is, it is right that we recognise that this is a, a process, not an event. The Government has set up alongside the Welsh and the Scottish Governments an intergovernmental review last year and it will be reporting soon. Let us see what comes of that, but the Noble Lord is correct. This is a process and we cannot let this be the end of it. We must make sure that it continues to, uh, continues to deliver as we would like it to deliver. My Lord, it's notwithstanding that the uh, Labour Party campaigned in 1978 uh, on a slogan of devolution will kill nationalism stone dead. Uh, would uh, my noble friend use the opportunity of the meeting with uh, Scottish ministers to discuss uh, their plans uh, to secede from the United Kingdom whilst remaining subject to control by Brussels and in particular ask them to explain how they will avoid a hard border between England and Scotland uh, and uh, uh, and, and in doing so, perhaps that might help my noble friend with his problems over the backstop. <laughs> well, uh, my noble friend, I will certainly raise several of those issues. Uh, I don't think it will surprise you to know that the Scottish Government ministers themselves quite often raise these uh, very issues. The meeting I have is rather more focused upon um, environment and farming. Uh, but nonetheless, the issues he raises are important and they will be part of the ongoing debate between the Scottish Government and the British Government. <laughs> between devolution and separation referred to by the noble lord. Will the minister confirm that after 17 years of devolution, when the Scottish people were asked to decide whether to separate from the United Kingdom or stay in it, they decisively decided to stay in the United yeah. Kingdom? Yeah. The noble lord is spot on. The Scottish people were very canny and they were very clever and they voted very correctly. <laughs> my lords, my lords. But, my Lords, this time last year, during the final stages of the European Union withdrawal bill, uh, never a day seemed to go by, but we were discussing common UK frameworks. Uh, can the Minister perhaps update us what's happening? Because it seems to have gone quiet. And how are we unsure that in those areas where there is shared responsibility, uh, that there is a parity of esteem and it will not be direction from Westminster? The Lord is very much correct. There needs to be a parity of esteem in all of these discussions. The intergovernmental review itself should look at the functioning of the frameworks. The joint ministerial committees that exist, um, I think, can be improved, and I suspect the improvements will emerge from the intergovernmental review. My Lords, my Lords, my Lords, my Lords, the Scottish Government decided to lower the blood alcohol limit for drivers, but I've not been able to find out whether that has been a success or not, a success in terms of reducing the casualty rate. Uh, will, if the, can the Noble Lord the Minister tell us, has it been successful? If not, will he undertake to write to me uh, with the stats? I will very much undertake to write to you with those statistics. I don't have them to hand. My Lords, uh, I think we should take this opportunity to congratulate those people present here who were members of the first Scottish Parliament. Um, I think that we should go beyond looking at intergovernmental uh, contacts and discussions and actually look at interparliamentary. And I think we should take this opportunity to consider a more federal approach to the UK. Having set that in motion in 1997, uh, I don't think we can now sit back and say nothing else can change. It's a perfect opportunity to make those changes. I hope you'll agree with that. It is important that we continue to learn about what is going on, and it is also true that while we have very strong working relationships government to government, that might not be as well established parliament to parliament, and there is no doubt that there would be a benefit in that. The learning of this House could well be useful as informing uh, the Scottish Parliament. But um, beyond that, it will be difficult to see until we have the results of the intergovernmental review. Universal credit should be paid separately to each member of a couple, not least to protect women um, surviving domestic abuse. However, they are wholly dependent on the Department for Work and Pensions and changes to the IT system to enable them to implement the policies. What active steps are the Department taking to help the Scottish Government do this and thereby enable the DWP itself to learn from Scottish experience? And if the Noble Lord can't answer himself, perhaps a letter could be written that would go into the library. 
The UK Government has been very diligent in reaching out to the Scottish Government on this issue of onward devolution of benefits for one very important reason. People's lives are at stake and their well-being is at the heart of this. I will, of course, put a letter to you setting out in greater detail the answer to that question, but please be assured that the UK Government takes its role very seriously, as indeed does the Scottish Government. Lord Bishop of St Albans. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, I declare my farming interests as set out in the register. Crime, wherever it takes place, has serious repercussions. Assessments through the Crime Victimisation Survey show that vandalism and theft were the most common crimes experienced by agriculture, forestry and fishing businesses. In addition to theft of agricultural instruments and machinery, fly-tipping, poaching and livestock worrying are also particular concerns for farmers. NFU Mutual's Rural Crime Report estimated the cost of rural crime was £44.5 million in 2017. I thank the Honourable Lord the Minister for his reply. Uh, I recently met with a group of Hertfordshire farmers, and amongst the many areas they raised with me was the problem of hair coursing, which is not only causing great damage to their land in some cases, but also uh, they've received physical, uh, threats of physical violence. And it really is a very difficult uh, problem. Uh, the low level of prosecution show that the current law is not making any impact on this at all. And those who have looked into it believe that some simple changes in the law could make a great difference. Would the Minister uh, commit to looking afresh at whether we can reform the Game Act uh, 1831 and the Night Poaching Act 1828 to bring the seizure and forfeiture powers into line with the Hunting Act 2004? M my lords, um, <laughs> my, my, my lords, I also um, last week met uh, Stuart Roberts, the Vice President of the NFU who farms in, in Hertfordshire, and clearly this is an area where the intimidation and fear of gangs arriving on people's land, often at night, is wholly unacceptable and is where the fear and intimidation must be uh, addressed. I take the point that the Right Reverend Prelate has made about um, some fairly uh, old acts, in, uh, but there is also the 1960 Game uh, Laws Amendment Act. But I do want to um, say that I think what the, what the police are doing in Lincolnshire with Operation Galileo, where there has been a 30% reduction, is a way forward, a 30% reduction last year. And also I would like to commend the six forces in the east of England which have come together to share intelligence to help put an end to this really devastating activity for farmers, particularly, I think, in the eastern and southern counties. And uh, also commend the work of uh, North Yorkshire. Issue of police resources. The current policing formula doesn't really take account of the uh, particular challenges and the particular problems in rural areas. Uh, the noble lord talked about uh, criminal, organised criminal gangs, and as we know, they are operating in a number of areas, uh, stealing livestock and uh, farm machinery almost to order. Um, these and, and causing real distress to isolated local communities. So. Uh, I wonder if the Minister would agree to speak to his colleagues in the Home Office about how those communities can be better supported, because people feel that uh, in the isolated communities they're fighting crime on their own and they need help. So it's a question of police resources, and perhaps the Minister would take that up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Lords, I certainly will. As, as, as Rural Affairs uh, Minister, I take uh, the whole range of the um, way in which rural communities are looked after, and in this case, I think, particularly in isolated communities, this is particularly great. I should say that the police allocation formula is a calculation that uses various data sources to share money between the authorities. The formula predicts the relative workload or need for each category of police activity, and I, as Rural Affairs Minister, take very keenly the fact that rural communities um, through work with the police and the police crime commissioners, have a lot of work that can be done, but I will certainly take this up with colleagues in the Home Office because I think uh, rural communities must be looked after as well. My Lord's my Lord's my, my Lord's accept the, the work that my, the uh, rural crime force uh, are much obliged. Uh, will my noble friend take this opportunity to congratulate the work of, I think, what was the first 
Rural Crime Task Force set up uh, by North Yorkshire, but will he use his good offices to ensure that rural crime is given a higher priority by the police, uh, by the Home Office? Well, Lords, in the same way as I said to the noble Baroness Lady Jones of Whitchurch, it very much is the case that uh, we need to work uh, with the Home Office. We do, of course, work very closely with them and the National Police Chiefs uh, um, uh, Council, for instance, for wildlife crime, but also the National Rural Crime Network, because clearly these rural crimes are issues that are devastating for rural communities. My noble friend might do well. This side, this side. This side. My Lords, the 2018 National Rural Crime Network survey revealed low expect- that low expectations, under-reporting, perceived poor response and outcomes, as well as worry, are all contributing factors to an increase of fear of crime amongst our rural communities. David Powys, the largest police geographical area in England and Wales, including Brecon and Radnor and West Wales, commissioned a report on farm and rural crime from Aberystwyth University. Has the Minister read that? Uh, and as a result of that, the police have ra- radically improved their rural... Coming up. They've radically improved their rural crime strategy in line with the policies that are operated in North Wales. Do, 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 do DEFRA and the Home Office have uh, plans to study the outcomes of these initiatives? Yes, we will look at all all, all surveys. And I I would like to refer, actually, to uh, your Lordship's committee, Select Committee on the Rural Economy, where uh, rightly highlighted the fear and perception of crime is viewed as a problem in rural areas. In fact, 38... 39% of rural people are worried about becoming a victim of crime compared with 19% nationally. So these are issues that we do need to address, and I'm most grateful to Noble Lords on that committee for highlighting some of the points. But yes, the answer is we have an honest endeavour to ensure that crime is addressed in all parts of the kingdom. As the Minister is aware, hairs are declining throughout our countryside, and hair coursing is particularly cruel. I thought the minister was unusually, I emphasise, unusually (laughs) unenthusiastic about pursuing the issue of hair coursing. Will he reassess the position and perhaps go back to the department and see what can be done to take some action on this important issue? My Lord, um Perhaps it's just my manner, but uh, all I would say is that uh, I addressed Operation Galileo. I commended the forces where these activities take place, and they are about aggravated arrivals of people committing violence to property, putting farmers and their families in fear because of their aggressive behaviour, illegal gambling. These are all gangs of people, my lords, who are undertaking a very considerable criminal activity and I use this opportunity of saying we need to work to stop these gangs from terrorising the countryside. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. (coughs) My, My lords, every death of someone sleeping rough on our streets or homeless is one too many. We have committed to halve rough sleeping by 2022 and end it by 2027 It's for this reason we're undertaking a significant programme of work to address this issue, backed by over £1.2 billion worth of funding. We believe our approach is working and we'll be publishing a full evaluation of the Rough Sleeping Initiative in the summer. I know that the Minister himself does share my deep concern uh, about those who who are are sleeping rough and so on. But can I ask the Minister, with the loss, say, of billions of pounds over the last decade, that has affected the work that local authorities are able to make. Um, And we have there, for instance, I have the figures, we we shared them last time, uh, that we had in the year 2010, 1,786 rough sleepers, while last year, 4,677. Now, there's something wrong here. And also, we have the deaths from 
uh, of rough sleepers on the streets, and in 2014, there were 475. In 2017, there were 597. This isn't progress. This isn't progress. Can we have a pledge that when the comprehensive spending review is um, undertaken, that they will restore those um, benefits that are so necessary for local councils to meet this need? My Lords, the, the, the noble Lord and I indeed did exchange uh, views on, on this previously. The, the, the difference in the way spending is dealt with is that the ring fence was taken off in 2009, actually under the last, uh, the last Labour government, and then carried on through the coalition years, with which the, 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 the noble Lord will be familiar, and still remains the case. But I do think we do need to also focus on the fact that money is spent centrally. Uh, in addition to what is spent locally. And the, the recent £100 million that was announced in August last year is beginning to have an effect. I mean, just to take a couple of examples of authorities, Brighton and Hove, deaths, uh, sorry, rough sleepers in 2017, 178, 2018, 64. Now, admittedly, there are nuances of difference in the way the figures are calculated, but not enough to account for that significant difference. And that spending is going on, and we, of course, have a minister dedicated to this area of activity, my Lords. My Lord, you will agree with me that one of the most important things with regard to homelessness is churn. People fall homeless, then they should be moved on. Have you looked at the possibility of adopting the PEC method, which I have talked to you about, which is about prevention, emergency, coping and cure? So then you can look at the money that is spent on the projects. Is it keeping people lingering lingering in the limbo of homelessness, or is it preventing them from getting homeless, or is it helping them to get out? We have to use something like the PEC method. It's free to you. I invented it. There's no cost. It's good to hear from the noble lord, and could I pay tribute to what he does on the, uh, the uh, rough sleeping advisory committee and very worthwhile work I know he is doing. There is much to commend Peck, as he says. I was yesterday in Redbridge, where they are adopting a, a, a method, a project, Malachi, which we are helping to fund, where it is indeed connected with work, and this sort of thing, I think, is the way forward. It's not the total answer, as I'm sure the noble lord will agree, but it certainly makes a big difference. My Lords, um, underlying the original question from my honourable friend, of which the Minister replied to in terms of funding, could he please really confirm that one of the real problems is the massive cuts um, since the Coalition, since the Labour Government, in local government funding? And this is seen in this last week with the additional ad going into administration of a large care homes concern. And there are other care home firms <coughs> that have gone into administration. And the main reason is the discounts on care home fees which local governments ha have, to, uh, have, have to have and therefore the care home's financial uh, uh, plan doesn't work because of the cuts in local government. Uh, my Lords, the, the noble Lord refers to a particular area uh, uh, where, where there is certainly a challenge, a problem in relation to social care. We await the social care green paper which will helpfully inform uh, as on, this, on this particular area. But it, it, he will, I know, acknowledge, as, as many other noble lords have done across the chamber, that this year we have had an increase in core spending, in local government spending, first time for a long while, but it is welcome, and hopefully that will continue as austerity comes to an end, my lords. Well, what progress have the government made in their assessment of the impact of social security cuts and restrictions on levels of homelessness and rough sleeping? Uh, my Lords, the, the noble lady has always raised a very valid point. I will write to her on the detail of that. It is important to look at the interlink between different government departments, different areas of activities. This, this is a complex area. It isn't just about the spending. There are issues of addiction here as well. But I will write to the noble lady, if I might, on that particular point and copy it to the library. Can I welcome the money that the government is investing in this area, significant sums. But can I ask the government what progress? Can you give an indication of the progress in securing uh, hostel beds for men and women with drug and alcohol problems in London and in progress in securing moving, move on accommodation for people with those issues. Uh, my, lo my Lords, the, no the Noble Earl is, is right about the particular challenges, as I say, in relation to addiction. He will know that 
we have designated 83 areas that are receiving assistance in relation to rough sleeping, and that does help with hostel spending. That includes, I think, from memory, all of, all of the London boroughs, all of our big, big uh, cities. But I will write to the Noble Lord in, in order that we can share it more widely and ensure that that list of monies going to those uh, local authorities is in that letter and, and copied to the Library, my lords. Today we have local government elections, so I think it's important that we recognise that the £16 billion that has been lost in the reduction to core funding to local government since 2010 can be matched against the £100 million, welcome as though it is, that the government intends to spend centrally. That will not solve the problem of homelessness. What will solve the problem of homelessness is if our local authorities have sufficient funding to be able to reduce homelessness as we did during the Labour years. Yeah. Yeah. My, my Lords, first of all, as I said, said uh, and I repeat to the noble lady, the, the ring fence came off under the last Labour government. The noble, lord is, noble lady is right about reductions, but it isn't just simply about local government spending. As I saw yesterday, there's a lot of spending that went on. Uh, from religious institutions, from faith institutions, which we are helping with, and I cited the example I saw yesterday. There's lots of good work going on in authorities up and down the country. We're spending money on hubs to help with homelessness, for example, Brighton and Hove. There's much good work being done. And it's also important to make this distinction. I was speaking about rough sleeping, not about homelessness. Homelessness is a much broader issue, as the noble lady will know, and, and representing very different challenges from the rough, rough sleeping one. And the figures that we've been looking at in, the, in, the la in large part are on rough sleeping, not on homelessness, my lords. Business of the House.